Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention again, I would like to uh, bring up our next panel. First, I'd like to dispense with some thank yous. I want to give a big thank you to all of the volunteers uh, who have helped to bring this event off for the last four days. There's practically an army of them. They've given up their days to come down and help make this event possible, and, we, and we're very grateful for all of the volunteers. Give them a nice hand, if you would, please. Our next panel is uh, entitled The New Political Compass. Uh, it features uh, Dr. Paul Ray and Jim Garrison. And I will introduce first Mr. Garrison, who is the president of Win Windham U Wisdom pardon me, University and the State of the World Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Garrison. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. As we bring the Democratic Convention to a close, all of us are trying to focus on what strategy will enable us to win the election, sweep the progressives into power, eradicate the mess of the Bush administration, and deal with the deep and very complex issues that are confronting the international community. In the next hour, we would like to present to you what we consider to be the most important political data currently out there and being considered. It was released here in Denver this week. It is based on polling recently done by Dr. Paul Ray, who has been studying these issues for several decades, has developed a very profound and innovative technique for polling the American people around values as opposed to opinions. And because of that, has an analysis which we call the new political compass. We're going to start with a PowerPoint presentation by Dr. Ray, after which I will make a few remarks of my own, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers until the close of the hour. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paul Ray. Hi. I'm a researcher, and so things don't always go as quick as you want. You've heard of just-in-time delivery. This is barely just-in-time delivery. <laughs> I, r I ran the last percentages at 6.30 this morning. <laughs> no, I actually, um, whoops, yeah. Can you see that? I think there's too much light on the screen. Is there? Any way to get the screen light down a little bit? Okay, is um, PowerPoint person, is there any way to see on the computer screen what's going on or? No, okay, so much for that. So uh, what I'm gonna do is talk about how political values give us a new way of talking about strategy and show you some dramatic new results. I've been doing values research for 22 years now, and what, we've seen, what I've got here is something I've never seen before. And it looks like there's been a dramatic shift in voter views uh, in the last two years, so that the numbers around ecological sustainability and doing something about the climate crisis have climbed into the 70 to 80% range. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my conclusion, some of the key conclusions first, so you can see where the stuff's coming from and make sure that you think there's enough evidence for it. And if you don't feel there's enough evidence for it, ask, and I'll fill in a whole lot more, because there's a whole lot more than we had time to put on the PowerPoint, okay? But we now have super majorities in the United States for major action on ecological sustainability renewable energy and like that. And it fits perfectly, let's see, did I put that there? Oh yeah, right there. <laughs> the most significant action we can take would be a clean green industrial policy and green collar jobs policy, a giant version of the Apollo Alliance, which Jerome Ringo heads up, you probably heard Jerome already, and uh, Van Jones's green collar jobs and Al Gore's energy challenge. That does three things for us if we take this up as a way of going after the campaign. It rebuilds the industrial base on very competitive new foundations. It wins elections, and I've got some nice data that'll show that, potentially giving new jobs to the voters who need the most, 
and it takes leadership on moving the whole planet toward ecological sustainability. Wouldn't it be nice if the U.S. was in front instead of at the very back on ecological sustainability and global warming and like that? So I want you to see right off the bat, can everybody read those numbers and statements? Okay, I'll read them to you. The very top one is a number that I have never before seen in polling. 87% agree we need to treat the planet as a living system. Basically, if you're in the polling business, 90% is, is just about unanimity in the American population. The other 10% being the duh response of can't cope, can't understand the idea, and so on. The next one, is there any way to get a better contrast on the screen? That's it, huh? We must stop, 82%, we must stop the destruction of the globe's farmlands, forests, and oceans. 81% agree corporations must take more responsibility for their impact on global warming. 80% agree we should change the way we live now so future generations have decent lives. 63%, too many people refuse to accept the seriousness of global warming. 62% agree the planet is headed for an environmental catastrophe unless we change. And incidentally, all of this is going to be on the, and probably right now, maybe is, uh, the State of the World Forum website. And I'll put the URL up at the very end, last slide. Uh, but it's not only that people are recognizing that there's a crisis, they're willing to respond and do something about it. 75% uh, of the people agree we need to work for the good of the planet, for it's our only home. We've never seen anything like this before. 71% say, I see myself as a citizen of planet Earth as well as an American. We're post-nationalistic as well. 55% agree we need solar and wind power for global warming, not coal and nuclear. Now, I, I want to say a crucial thing here. If I said, are you for solar and wind, 85% would agree. That, that would be a big uh, nothing in a way. So if you want to really get the question to have some bite, you have to have a trade-off. And so I put in not coal and nuclear. Well, by God, there they are anyway. So that, that's uh, quite striking. I'm willing to, 51% agree, I'm willing to do volunteer work as part of a commitment to help save the planet. When you put it that way, about two-thirds of the people will actually do it. And that's a very crucial thing to know. 45% uh, agree working on the pro planet's problems is now the main task for humanity. Now, are they willing to pay through the nose? No. <laughs> Here's some numbers that have not changed in 20 years, okay? These are the very same people, very same survey, the same ones who are 87%, you know, we've got to deal with global warming. Would you pay more taxes to help solve our global warming pr problems? No, 25%, 50% refuse. And would you pay 50 cents more a gallon for gasoline if it's only used for to stop global warming? 50% disagree again, only 23% agree. Now, it's crucial to know that because this has been on the agenda for 20 years, I've asked people in focus groups, well, why not? And the answer is, First of all, why should I pay big business and big government to do what they should have been doing all this time anyway, right? Uh, and Americans, of course, believe in new technology because we've seen all the demonstrations of how technology lowers prices. And so what you've got as another kind of response, the one of the generic responses, is I want to see investment in new technologies that will actually solve the problem, not bludgeoning us with uh, pushing up the prices to consumers and so on. And a third one is like, well, we've been taken all this time. Do you really think I'm that big a sucker? Uh, you know, and so those are the kind of reasoning processes that are going on. So it's, it's important to see that a lot of this refusal is not about ignorance. It's about knowing too much about how the system works. <laughs> and that's, that's a very important distinction. It's, it's not just about selfishness as the Bush administration might want you to think. It's about believing that the Bush administration is basically full of shit, uh, and, and, and Exxon, and, and so on. Yes, yeah, you may quote me on that. <laughs> so, with this 
remarkable shift in the last two years in public opinion of accepting that global warming is real and really wanting to get engaged in doing something about it goes another part, which is that we can actually change the way we look at politics and see that there exists a way to win politically. So I, I, I want to say that this is a crucial piece. If it's only about being right, we're willing to be losers. If it was only about winning, we might be willing to sell our souls like the Republicans. But this is about holding the tension between both winning and being right. And so let's look at what that does for us. Okay, so first point. These are not, this is not a standard opinion poll. These are a values poll. And values are our most important priorities in life. It's very closely related to your worldview, what you think is real, what succeeds in life, and so on. Values are actually the best predictors of what you'll do. Demographics are not on questionnaires because demographics are good predictors. In fact, they're rather poor predictors. They're there because they're cheap. Values research is expensive. Uh, this, this is all about the profits for the guys that's doing the polling, nothing about what you need to hear. Uh, the values are interesting because from a newspaper standpoint, they're not, they're not interesting because it's not, not something new to report next week. Uh, they don't change over five years, 10 years. In five or 10 years, you may see values shift, but not immediately. So that, but one of the reasons that they don't change quick is the last point. You're far more likely to accept information that already fits your values and reject the stuff that doesn't fit your values. See the religious right for the extreme example of that, right? So that's, that's what's different about what you, what you just saw on some key value stuff and what's different about what we're going to do. So what I did was add to the value studies I've been doing over the last 20 years 150 questionnaire items, making 25 new measurement scales. And the political values are mostly about what our country should be, how to live together as citizens, what we want us for, from politics. And they're a really different kind of information than demographics. Just as the other values and lifestyle stuff I did was uncorrelated with demographics, the political values are too. You can have, two people can have identical political values and completely different incomes, occupation, education, religion, and so on. Or they could have identical income, occupation, education, religion, race, and so on, and have very different values. In other words, there is a zero correlation between values on the one hand and the, the deep structure of what you want and what you believe uh, and your demographics. And one of the reasons is, contrary to uh, uh, Lakoff, this, most of the values we have are not inculcated in childhood. We learn them as adults. And who you associate with matters, and values are, in fact, cultural. Uh, but I won't go into the cultural stuff let, because it takes too long. I want to leave time for questions. But if you, if you really need to know about that, I'll be happy to answer the question. Now, here's the world according to the politics of the late, of, say, 1950s to the late 1990s. You've got a bell-shaped curve. Everybody knows what a bell-shaped curve is. And what the politicians of the Bill Clinton era will tell you is only the outside tails matter. But in the middle, where most of the people are, it's all a mushy middle. Well, when you look at values, you discover that this is exactly wrong. What's wrong about it is when you ask people about opinion stuff, you get only what's at the surface. When you ask about what's deeper, suddenly something new appears, and it's in eight living colors and all that kind of stuff. So on the left is still the political, in the political, what I call the political West, is still the liberals at 26.7% of likely voters. Okay. Crucial thing, this is the picture of voters, not the whole population. I have pictures of the whole population. This year, the likely voting is going to go up from about 50% of the adult population to about 64%. That's the best guess of everybody who's doing the polls. So that's what I've got. And so we, what I did is I asked, are you a registered voter? And how likely are you to vote? And the ones who said they were certain to vote and registered voters are 64% of adults. That is a number you can pretty well count on. Uh, so 
Over opposite the liberals, however, are 24% of likely voters are the social conservatives and only the social conservatives. That big gray spot in the middle are the ones who are not likely to vote. Now, the way this is working is we're taking how intensely people feel their values. At the middle, at the zero, zero point in the crosshairs is the duh kind of response, or I'm, I'm too cross-pressured, I'm too discouraged, I don't know what to do, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and out toward the edge are the people who feel most intense. Now, one of the first things you may see are some cracks between the social conservatives in red and the business conservatives down in the south on the compass in purple. The conservative coalition is in the process of breaking up. The correlation between their views politically is going away. What you got there? Oh, the handout. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay, you can see the, you can see the picture uh, on the handout in living color. All right, now, so business conservatives are 20, anybody who has business conservative values is 20% of likely voters. In just a minute, though, when we get into who's actively having business conservatism as their main stance, it's only 6% of the voters, but we'll get to that. What's new, what we've never seen before in our political discussions is the green wedge up on top. The green wedge up on top turns out to reflect a whole bunch of new things, the women's movement, the, the peace movement, jobs and social justice, the civil rights movement, all the green, all the ecological and so on. They've never seen any of their issues in any of the last six national elections until this year. And so that's what's really new. If you, there's, this political demand has been hanging around for 20 years, but now somebody's actually responded to it and all sorts of new things are coming up. So the, each of the four political positions is a different subculture. How do we know it's a subculture? They talk differently about what's important in their own life and in politics. They often have very different myths and want ideal worlds that are very different from each other. And most of all, they often think of all the others as bad and wrong. Uh, so making others bad and wrong is how cultures maintain themselves, right? Uh, so uh, here's what's new. The green part, that green wedge, political north, it grew out of the new social movements, civil rights, environmental, women's, peace, anti-war, jobs and social justice, organic food, that's what I left out, green everything, health, national health care, all that. So all their values and issues are called liberal, but here's the bite. Only 72% of the people in that green wedge call themselves liberal or left. The liberal brand is seriously damaged among these folks. So they consider themselves independent, they consider themselves centrist, and it's a huge portion of all the swing voters in the country. And it contains all demographic groups, but they are very consistent in terms of their values. And here's a crucial thing you need to know. None of them are single issue voters. They all have about six big issues they care about at once. Single issue voting idea is bullshit. It, in fact, is not true. It's no, no more true than the unique advertising proposition is true in, the, in advertising, the unique selling proposition in advertising. All right, so political north, here's the values that separate the crucial ones that separate political north from everybody else around that compass. They want action on global climate crisis and sustainability. Th those are, these are the folks who are the opinion leaders on all those big numbers you saw. They've been around for 20 years. And what, what I've known for doing values research for a long, long time is that there are three or four times as many opinion leaders in the political north as any part, other part of the compass. Tell one, one person and he'll, they'll tell 12 others. Now this, makes, this is very nice because this makes for a cheap advertising campaign, a cheap information campaign. You don't have to have the big expensive television buys that's driving politics. You speak to the opinion leaders. Uh, so environment, what they, they actually are people who, given a trade-off, and I have a whole bunch of trade-off questions, will pick the environment and the ecology over the economy. A very important kind of thing. They have a big concern for the whole planet, not just the United States. They're going way beyond nationalism. Here's a crucial one that really bites. They want to leave a sustainable legacy for future generations and their own children. 
One of the things we saw, I didn't have that number up there, I don't think, uh, but people are saying, I'm very worried about what kind of world my children or grandchildren are going to inherit. And the concern for what's going to happen to the children, the concern for what's going to happen to the grandchildren, is a hot button of this election. It's something you really need to know. Because this is, this is something you could speak directly to over and over and over again. It's a very good frame, as Lakoff would talk about it. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting, these people who don't consider themselves liberals now want the liberal social safety net anyhow. Okay, in fact, they want national health care, they want national education, and pick one and they want it. Uh, and they uh, strongly support all women's issues, and there's a good reason for this. Women have been leading the way for the last 40, 50 years on this major cultural shift in the United States population. I did a, a bunch of research that I reported in a book called The Cultural Creatives that showed that a huge portion of Americans have changed their lifestyle. It's about 30% now. All across Europe and in Japan, about a third of the population have changed their lifestyles in precisely the same way as in America. We're actually lagging a little bit behind. But that change in American values for the cultural creatives and for the politics, it turns out, has been led by women. This is about women's concerns going public for the first time in history. Uh, so this has had a major effect on politics this year. I'll just name two things, and the, you'll see a bunch of others in just a minute. The demand for authenticity is a big deal. On the internet, that means a demand for transparency. Show us. Don't just talk to us about it. Don't just have the emotional feel-good stuff that feels authentic but turns out to be a lie. The transparent authenticity on the internet translates into transparency. In God we trust, all others bring evidence. So. Issues of political north and women are getting on the agenda, finally, for the first time, and that's the big deal. So, can everybody see that picture? Uh, it's a second version of the political compass. They're on the hand. Has everybody got handouts? No. All right. Let, let me come up and point to stuff. Up here are what I call the new progressives. This is a blue-green synthesis, and this is Obama's base right here. It's, you've got a convergence on it from liberals who are lower middle class. This is about 10.5% for the affluent progressives. This is about 14% for the li conventional liberals. Together, that's the, about 25%. Also, green, oh, down around this, you've got moderates and affluent business conservatives. Notice, only 6.3% of all the population primarily operate from business conservative values. That's maybe 85% of the money in politics, but only 6% of the actual people. And then the social conservatives with the Gothic church lettering are about 25% here. And uh, what's happening is the pure social conservative stuff is splitting off from the business conservatives over the war and Main Street versus Wall Street and Karl Rove pissing on them from on high and like that. But there's another big crack developing, and it's the most interesting part of the story. Because up here in the political northeast is where the action is. And I want to talk to you at length about that because it allows a winning strategy, which I call a bridge across the north, across all the people who feel intensely about all the issues that I just named. And what you've got is 35% of all likely voters are sitting right here cross-pressured, they are simultaneously, now listen carefully, they are social conservatives, greener than green, want the liberal safety net, and in trouble in this recession. I say that is a golden opportunity. What's going on, I said values change slow, they're holding two kinds of values, and they're not letting go of the social conservative ones yet, but they've taken up with the green ones, and so there's a nice big arrow here saying they're moving that direction toward Obama right away. So, so the key idea, the tagline, is the winning strategy is a, a bridge across the north, not a run to the center. Or as uh, they used to say in Texas, ain't nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> 
Okay, so key facts. Women in the Northeast are 45% of all likely voters. African Americans in the Northeast, get this, are 67% of all likely voters. The working class in the Northeast are 51% of all likely working class voters. Hispanics in the Northeast are 40% of all likely Hispanic voters. Folks, this is a giant opportunity like we've never seen before if you reframe how you look at the world. You know, if you take that bell-shaped curve, ain't no way to get to the social conservatives except through the mushy middle, running through the center, right? Wrong. <laughs> totally wrong. So it's time to make them an offer. All these voters are hurting in the recession. They want the clean, green jobs. They want a green industrial base. And they also want the national health care, help for homeowners, national education, and like that. And you've got a winning strategy. If you take that green arc that you see, that you saw just a moment ago, right there, that's 53%, all by itself, that's 53% of likely voters. Okay, all by, never, you, you can, 10 other things you can do, but you got 53% of likely voters right there. So Obama's done a wonderful job of having the soaring rhetoric. People are now saying, where's the beef? And my answer is, there's the beef, right there. Okay. Uh, let's see, all the issues that we've called women's or minority issues have now moved into the mainstream. The biggest numbers, of course, are there's a lot of more women voters than anybody. So the gender gap is 8% in the political north in general, but it's 15% in the northeast. So those are big, big numbers. So the conclusion is we're no longer on the margins, we're at critical mass. I already said 70 to 80% of Americans. Key idea, equity economy and ecology come together right here. Social justice and making the economy work and the ecology are all coming together. This is a unique opportunity where we can both win and be right. So this is a short version. On the State of the World Forum website, probably this hour or, or with it before the day is out, so that's in, uh, the, you can get a, a briefing document that's eight pages long. It's, the document is, has the tag on it for the, for, in, as a word file. It says NPC briefing three dot doc. And it's on the State of the World Web for, State of the World Forum. And that's what you can't read. www.worldforum, www.worldforum.org. So anybody wants to download that, you're absolutely welcome to it. Do whatever you want with it. Okay, Jim. Thank you, Paul. It's very exciting stuff. And before opening it up to questions and comments, I just wanted to make a few uh, observations. The first and most important one is just to acknowledge the sophistication of the American people. After eight years of the Bush administration, after a media that has basically conspired against us to present hard information on things like global warming, between 70 and 80 percent of the American people today understand that global warming and the climate change crisis is the single most urgent issue confronting humanity. And I just want to underscore that, that this is a perception that is not naive. It is not a perception that's new age or marginal. It is a perception that is based on the reality that uh, Rajendra Pachari who accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last December, not only said was the most urgent issue of our time, but said that if the world does not deal with global warming by 2012, we may well lose any capacity to do so. The synergies between climate and the ecology and global warming are quite literally, literally synergizing out of our control. National Geographic, three days ago, released a documentary that they just completed about the ice melt-off on Greenland. 
they said every 24 hours enough ice melts off of Greenland to cover the state of Texas in 13 feet of water. That's every 24 hours. So the fact that the American public understands intuitively, if not explicitly, that we have come as a race, as a nation, to the single most critical issue of our generation should not be ignored. The second observation that I'd like to make is that there's a paradox between what Paul put up on the compass about the political north being 26.3% of the electorate and the obvious reality of American politics. The question is, where are they? Why aren't they organized? They're the largest single voting bloc, but they do not appear to have any measurable effect on our political structures. One of the observations about the political north and the cultural creatives as a whole is that when you poll them, they think they're essentially alone. Because they do not see their values reflected in the political parties, the Republicans being in the grip of the traditionalists and the business and social conservatives, the Democrats in the grip of the, the liberals, they're not reflected in the media, they're not reflected in the civic or governmental institutions. They tend to be incredibly engaged with their lives, with their communities, but they don't necessarily interface and engage with structured, organized political politics. What we just saw with Barack Obama is a politician predicted by Paul five years ago who said that at some point in the future, he wrote in, in, in 2003, some political candidate was going to speak to the values of the cultural creatives in the political north and create a political tsunami. That has just happened. That has just happened. But this underscores a very important consideration that we need to understand as the Democratic Convention comes to a close. One of the reasons why Barack Obama defeated Hillary Clinton is because while she went to the center that isn't there, he spoke to the future and to the values of the new progressives who are growing day by day in numerical superiority. What happened as soon as he cinched the nomination is that he has begun his own journey to the center that isn't there. And if you will note in the polling across this nation that when Barack cinched the nomination, he was five to 10 points ahead of John McCain. The more he's gone to the center, the closer the polls have gotten. And the Zogby poll released uh, late last week showed for the first time that John McCain was ahead of Barack Obama in the polls. Why? Because the liberals and the progressives and the youth who had come out for him while he was speaking to those values have gotten very confused as he's been talking about Afghanistan being the right war and selected oil drilling off the coast of uh, California and Florida and making a series of pronouncements that are beginning to be experienced by the political north as flip-flopping and moving toward a position that they don't identify. Remember, they're neither left nor right. They're neither Republican nor conservative. They're representing essentially the human future. And to the degree to which the Democratic Party and Barack Obama speak to that future and then link those progressive values to the green economy and green politics, you not only have the 53% that are now progressive, you get the 70 to 80% that now want something done on global warming, and that is the winning strategy. That's why we're talking about this bridge across the north, not a run to the center. The final point that I want to make before opening it up 
is that this is not a uniquely American phenomenon. There have been polls done in Europe, in Germany, in France, in the Netherlands, in Italy, in Hungary, and one just done about two months ago in Japan, all showing same number. that one-third of the public, essentially the same numbers that are pertaining to the United States, now pertain to Europe and Japan. What that means is that we progressives have now become critical mass. The one thing we need to do, remembering that we all basically think we're alone because we're not seeing our values reflected back in the conventional media and symbolo uh, symbology structures, is that we have to be organized. We have to come together in new, profound ways that need to be global in scope right from the beginning. So while Wisdom University is conducting the research on the cultural creatives, on the political north, the State of the World Forum is in the process of trying to network globally organizations, individuals that understand this data and are wanting to bring this data into public parlance. That's why we're here at the Democratic Convention. That's why we're going to release information at the Republican Convention. That's why we're mounting a public education campaign to get the new political compass as widely disseminated among influence leaders in media and politics and academia and in government as we possibly can. One event to which I would like to draw your attention, and that is that in November 2009, between November 9 and 15, 2009, the State of the World Forum is convening a major gathering in Washington, D.C., at the Washington Hilton, which we've basically booked for the occasion. We want to bring three groups together. Number one, working with Lester Brown, Rajendra Pachari, Avery Lovins, Jim Hansen from NASA. We want to bring together the facts that indicate that it is our tragic inaction on global warming, as Mr. Pachari said just day before yesterday, uh, in Ankara, Ghana, where the countries of the world have come together once again over U.S. opposition to come to terms with global warming. We want to begin to focus on the fact that, as Jim Hansen says, human civilization, for the first time in our collective history, is now systemically threatened by our inaction on global warming. Secondly, we want Paul and all the people who've done studies on the political north and the cultural creatives around the world to articulate the latest research with a clear message to the power elites in Washington, D.C. that number one, action must be taken. Number two, there's a majority of progressives and a majority of Americans that understand the ecological crisis that if the politicians would take this action, they will win the election. And number three, we want to bring together all those technologists and profile the people who have developed the solutions that can solve these problems. We are not in a global crisis because there's no solutions. We are in a global crisis because we're not adopting technology solutions that have been here for a very long time. It is our lack of appreciation of this at a political level that actually constitutes the major part of our predicament. So that is what Paul has uncovered on behalf of us all. It's what we're here to organize around. We want business cards. We want, we're downloading our, our data. I just checked our computer, our website at State of the World Forum, which is worldforum.org. And you can go there right now uh, at www.worldforum.org and download this briefing document and send it out to everybody uh, that you know. Thank you all. And another thing, uh, we're going to bring up on that website all the top line data from the survey for anybody who's an activist 
and a blogger to use in your own way. We're not going to try to claim any copyright. This is called copyleft creative commons and so on. It's going to be available very shortly. All sorts of cross tabs that you can use and so on. Like those statements with the percentage and the people who various statements after it organized in a number of different ways. So okay. question, we have questions? 15 minutes for questions and comments. Five minutes. Hi, this is Pat Lynch with Women's Radio and Women's Radio Channel. Good morning. Hi. And seeing the information about how the women's voice has grown, number one, how do you think Barack Obama and his campaign, how do you think they're doing addressing issues that women think are important? And number two, when do you think that the progressives will say it is the right time to have a woman president? <laughs> I think we just barely fell short of having a woman be the next president. Uh, but the crucial issue is Obama's doing a, a perfectly good job of speaking to women, and the campaign is doing a perfectly good job with it. Uh, they're, they're hitting most notes correctly. The problem is that at this moment, the, the where's the beef kind of question is something women are asking because they're concerned about what's going to happen to their children and their voices are leading on a lot of these issues. So the campaign really needs to match the soaring rhetoric with some things that feel to people like, yes, these are practical problem solving that are going to meet our needs pretty darn quick. And I, I think that's, that's basically the, the message. And when I stress the importance of women, I'm stressing the creative role of women in uh, making this go. Next. My name is Sandy Briggs. I'm the county chair in Summit County um, and really in the trenches. And my question has to do with uh, how we take this information and make it practical in terms of we're doing three things on the ground. We're registering voters, we're calling people up to, for voter ID, and we're canvassing. And the script on, on the phone is, uh, if the election was held today, which, would you vote for John McCain or, or Barack Obama? And I, I don't think that's the old way of doing it. I think we have to start off with a message. And I, this is where I want you guys to, to pipe in, is that when we have that voter contact, because it's, it's very rare that when you phone somebody, you're going to get a real person. It's probably 20% of the time or even less in a place that's as active as Summit County, because people are are out of their homes most of the time. Mm -hmm. So when you get in touch with someone, what's the message? Not who are you going to vote for, but is what do you? How do you feel? You know, kind of get them uh, engaged in talking about values, and then say, you know, Rock Romer is this way on on this value that you express. Okay, that's a perfect question. One of the key things about the values research, it was originally designed and still is good for forming messaging, for personal contact, for sales, for marketing, for campaigns. One of the things that's going to be put up on the website is all the values items organized by the values themes that are reflected. The values messages, once you get the theme, you can put all sorts of conversational topics together or advertising themes together that reflect those particular values and you know very likely which kind of voters are going to want which kind of, of values emphasized for your contact. And so that's one of the things that will be available for you to do. Next. Randy. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Brent Green. Paul and I have been following your work for a long time. I'm the author of a book called Marketing to Leading Edge Baby Boomers, and I have the number one okay. Google uh, search rank blog on the boomer generation in business. One of the things we've been seeing in other research and... Closer to your mouth. Okay. One of the things we've been seeing in other research and uh, studies has been that there is a age-related factor in influencing these value shifts toward legacy, toward communicating a world that is in crisis and so forth. And you said that all demographic groups are in this study that you've done, but I wonder if there's any age skewing uh, in particular toward the baby boomers because a lot of the values that you described, the, the source of those values were legacy values from the 60s and 70s. That's a terrific question. The eight, you, what you get is the values are held with all different age groups 
but they give a different spin to it according to their experience. So, for example, on leaving a legacy for future generations, the grandparents, eight people eight over age 50, are incredibly drawn into this because leaving a legacy for them, themselves is a big deal. Mothers of young children have a different notion. So you, the legacy question might, might need to be framed differently to different age groups. But if the, is the value there? Yes, it's there in all age groups. But the framing of how to put the value across and what it means to them turns out to be different in different age areas. But basically, if you take the generational analysis that people like to talk about, the generation numbers are completely flat across all of these political values. It's just the most amazing thing. It just has, you know, everybody has them according to who they associate with. So values are more cultural, more interpersonal, more who, you, who your friendship network is, your peers are, than they are age related. The key thing here is we live in an information saturated world. Practically everybody's got access to, inter, to information or they're getting information through their peers. And that, is, that interaction pattern seems to shape how the values come out much more than the demographics do. And so that, that's a very important aspect of why it's cultural. And it's an important aspect of why we need to speak to the cultural shift in the values frame that I've been talking about. But there's, there's a lot more, and I'm gonna go downstairs and talk to the bloggers now, and if you wanna tag along, why, well, feel free. Uh, so, but we have to, we've been told we have to wrap it up so the next people can come on stage. <laughs> Thank you.